subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello students, welcome once again to Sinai High School Hour on Joy Learning Channel. This is your facilitator Kojo Uswapia coming to you once again. It's time for GKA. Join me in today's very interesting lesson. I know you're going to learn a lot, so I want you to join me. As usual, pick your parts, pencils, pen, whatever you need to write, so that at least you could put a lot of information down and then we can have a very nice lesson for today. So join me as we start our lesson for today. Today we are treating prehistoric art. Prehistoric art is a very important topic, and in, especially in your first year, and you should have a lot of knowledge about it. It forms the basics of what you are going to do as a visual arts course, GK. Now, what are the objectives for this lesson? So as you can see on your screens, let's read them out. So first, you should be able to explain the beginnings, relevance, and locations of prehistoric art. Again, you should be able to explain the nature, uses, and reasons for creating prehistoric art. And the last is that you should be able to state the types of art, media, and techniques used by the cave artist. So, when did prehistoric art start at all? What are the beginnings of prehistoric art? That's the first question that we must ask ourselves. So the term prehistoric art refers to art that existed before the existence of documents or written documents. So before man started writing, that's what we are referring to. It is art that was created by people in the era when any form of writing language has yet not been developed. So that's what prehistoric refers to. Now, this art that we are talking about in human history, as you see on your screen, lasted between 30,000 BC to around 5,000 BC. That's a long time ago, but it is still relevant today, and we still have to learn so much about prehistoric man. Now, prehistoric art uh, mainly comprised of paintings, engravings, sculpture, and poetry. There could possibly be more, but these were, are the ones that have been identified so far. Now, works of art were used in recording the activities of the prehistoric humans. You remember we just said that there were no written history. So the prehistoric man used his art to record such events in his life. Now, the study of prehistoric art to us is, going, is very important because it will show the role arts played in early life of man or human beings and it serves as a guide for us to use art in the modern development of man. So learning about prehistoric art is very important to all of us. Now, what are the locations of prehistoric art? Where did prehistoric art, where, where was it found at all? Or where does it exist? To surprise you, a lot of things that you are going to get to know today. So the discovery of prehistoric art are distributed all over the world. It's found almost everywhere in this part of the world. So it comes in diverse ethnic groups and societies and cultures. Artworks have been found in caves and whereas all over the world. So prehistoric art does not exist only in one place in the world, it exists all over the world. Now, one striking thing is that they share some common similarities. Even though they are made different in different parts of the world, they still share some common characteristics or resemblance. There's no evidence, evidence whatsoever that one group of people influence the other. But you could see that there is a striking similarity or resemblance between the various arts that we'll find. Now, let's try back in history and find out where the first prehistoric arts were found. So you can see on your screens. So the first one was basically found in Mozambique. Yes, right here in Africa by French soldiers or the army around 1721. So it was just found by these soldiers whilst they were on their errands. The next thing, or the next cave that was found was again in Africa, in Namibia. That's the Apollo 11 cave found in 1972. And 
what they mostly found in these caves were fragments of stone of all plaques with paint on them, including four recognizable animal or images of animals. Again, the water-worn pebble that looks like a human face was also found in Bakapanzat, that's around uh, South Africa. Um, again, other history says, or most of the works are also found in other parts of Africa, like the Kalahari, uh, Tibesti, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, Zimbabwe, all over Africa. Now, what I've tried to do is to find out some of these locations for you. So, as you see on your screens, the images, there are two images there. On the left hand side, that's the entrance to the Apollo 11 cave in Nam Namibia. And on the right hand side, you can see some stone fragments that were found. Can you identify the image on the fragment that you see? Yeah, it looks like um, a wild, one of these wild animals or cats or something like that. So these ones were found in the caves of Apollo 11 in Namibia. Again, that's Makapan's Gat uh, Valley in South Africa. And these pebbles were found there. Um, it looks like a human face, right? Yes, but these were some of the artworks found in these valleys in South Africa. Now, I've tried to look out for the maps that identify the prehistoric art found in Africa. So as you see on your screens, um, our source, as you can see, is the General Knowledge and Art Book for senior high schools. And you can see all these locations. There are 22 of them. Find time to look through. But you can see that they are all over Africa. That's why we said earlier that there was no one place that prehistoric art was found. It was found all over the world. And in Africa, it was the same because it was found all over Africa. So the black locations, as you see, which are numbered 1 to 22, are those places that these prehistoric art were found. So find time to know their locations. Now again, we are still on prehistoric art locations. So the world's oldest prehistoric paintings are found in Chavez Cave, that's in France. And this was found around 25,000 BC, just around that. Next, we have the Cosquer Cave near Marcel, also in France. So that cave was also very important. We'll discuss that briefly later. Then in 1879, an amateur archaeologist um, who was just playing around accidentally found the paintings of a group of bisons in the Arthomera in Spain. That's a very important uh, prehistoric site now. And we'll be discussing uh, just a little about it. But know these locations. And these locations, as you can see, are locations in Europe. So the first two are from France. And the last one that you can see is Spain. Now, I have a map there to help us identify some of these locations, especially in Europe. If you already look at that in Africa, let's look at that in Europe. So I have a stars there, black stars over there, identifying the locations of these prehistoric sites that were found, or caves that were found. So you can see the Altamira. Um, the year is there, 1879. And um, we have the Lascaux, also in France. Then the Chauvet, then the Cosquer. So these are very important uh, prehistoric cave sites, especially that of Lascaux. We'll be discussing much about that later on. But it's a very important prehistoric art that is very relevant up to today. Now, these are some images that we found in the caves of Altamira in Spain. You can take a look at it. Very, very intrinsic, very, very nice. It beats the mind how the prehistoric man was able to do a lot of these art forms. So this one that you see is the Atamira cave in Spain. Next, that's the Lascaux in France. That's the entrance. This cave has marvelous paintings, very marvelous paintings of basically animals. And it's so, 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 so very important up to today. Some time back, it was even closed, but now it's reopened for the public. If you find time and you have enough money, travel to France and just visit this cave. It's very, very important in history and, and, and 
I'll, I'll just wish you would just go there. It, it will just facil uh, facilitate you. Um, next, I want us to discuss the nature and reasons, uses of prehistoric art. So was there any reason backing the reason why the prehistoric man wanted to engage in prehistoric art? That's what we really want to find out. So initially, historians and archaeologists and people who found out these caves thought it was just art for art's sake. Oh, perhaps the prehistoric man wanted to use, do some art on the caves. That's why he did it. But later it turned out to, something, to be something else. So a close look at the limited range of subjects, especially in these caves, which had to do with animal life and fertility indicates that they were not mere decorations. So these artworks were not, they were just not de uh, uh, decorations. They had something to do more than just decorations. Again, the remoteness and inaccessibility of many of the cave paintings that were found, and again, the sculpture and engravings and that were all discovered indicate that the works were not just there for fun. They were just meant to be preserved. That's why we have the belief that the prehistoric man was, didn't do this art just for art's sake, but he had a very good reason for embarking on these um, artworks. Now, we've tried to identify six of these reasons. So it is without doubt that prehistoric men and women have more relevant reasons for producing these artworks, and we are going to look at these six of them. So the first, as you can see on your screen, indicates that the prehistoric man did his art as a means of survival. Again, it was a form of magic to overcome the animals that he encountered or that endangered his life. Then, it was a form of what? Ritual and a worship. Again, it was a teaching tool for amateur hunters who had just become part of the society. Again, it was a means of recording information and narrating stories of the prehistoric man. And lastly, it had to do with fertility charms. So we're going to look at these six reasons that made the prehistoric man do his art that you see today. So let's take a look, first look at the first one, a uh, means of survival. So the, fir the first thing that we can see from the image that we see is that, yes, the prehistoric man was a hunter. So he went about his duties and then tried to hunt for animals and bring it to the family for them to have their meals. So as you can see in the image, uh, the prehistoric man is doing some hunting and that was the essence of him performing some of the arts. Now let's look at the, f the, the, let's go into details for the first point. So animals were a dominant subject matter in the various prehistoric arts uh, that were found in the varied caves. So they included the paintings, sculpture, engravings, poetry that we discussed earlier. Now these themes were very important because just, just take a look at it. He wants to survive. So he has to find all the ways to ensure that whatever he needs for himself and the family are done. Now let's look at the, the reasons. Now the first one is that the fleshy parts of or meat of the hunted animals were eaten as food. So, so for, for survival, he needed food and he had to hunt. Again, the outer coverings of skins of the animals, the feathers of the range of the various birds, and the furs of mammals were worn on the body as a form of what? Clothes to protect against the harsh weather conditions. Yes, that's purely a way of survival, trying to find something to clothe yourself. Again, the fats and marrows from the animals were used as fuel for lamps from the stone or clay. So these fats that were gotten from the, or that they got from the various marrows and the, the animals, I mean, were used for Lamp for the lamps as fuel, so that they could light up their caves and then have a, a light, as, as you can see. Now the fats of the animals and their blood were used for producing color pigments and binders for colored ochres from rocks. Again, the bones of the animals were used for the production of simple weapons for hunting activities and also as what? Palettes for the mixing of paint. And lastly, for survival, he used the various animals that he, he hunted for the skins, he used them as tents to at least cover their family. 
So you use it as a shelter and then have the family live in these tents. Now again, the prehistoric man used the pre the whatever he did as for hunting and for various purposes as a means of magic to overcome the animals that endangered his life. Um, what is this magic that we are talking about? So the prehistoric man, basically, like we said, were hunters. And they were always hunting animals that were dangerous, that were ferocious, that could easily kill them. So hunting was very risky, and they tried to fish out weapons that could at least help them conquer these animals. So as you can see on the screen, there's an Im image there showing the prehistoric man trying to hunt. Now, prehistoric men resorted to a kind of practical magic known today as what sympathetic magic or hunting magic. This is a very um, something that beats the mind, but that's what the prehistoric man believed in. And we are going to look at it sympathetic magic or hunting magic. So, this hunting magic was based on the belief that there's a close bond or link between an object and its image. So anything done to the drawn image was believed to affect the soul of the animal. So what the prehistoric man basically was doing that, he draws the animals that he's going to hunt right on the walls of the caves. And then he hunts it right in the cave by drawing arrows and putting sharp objects in it, believing that something is going to happen. So sensitive parts of the images of the animals to be hunted, such as the eyes, the ears, and nose were omitted. So obviously, if the eyes were, was omitted, then obviously when they are hunting, the animals wouldn't see them, right? If the, uh, the ears were omitted, then if they are approaching the animals, the animals wouldn't hear that they are approaching. Now, it was believed that this prevented the live animal from seeing, hearing, or smelling the presence of the caveman in the eve of hunting. That's sympathetic magic. Now, sometimes arrows were drawn to drawn stab into the bodies of the image. The caveman believed that this would ultimately render the animals powerless and wounded, bringing the animal under control, as you can see. So even before he got there, he had already hunted the animal right in the caves by putting in arrows on the bodies and ensuring that there are no eyes for the drawings and so on. So before he even gets to the hunting grounds, the animal is already weakened and he could just easily capture it. Now, sympathetic magic was to ensure success in capturing and killing these animals, like we said. So, new paintings were made for another day's hunt. So, each and every day that they went for hunting, there were new drawings that were made in these caves. Now, this accounted for the numerous paintings and the engravings and sculpture, because they kept on doing these paintings and engravings and sculpture all over again, and at any moment in time that they needed to go and hunt. So the image that you see there, you can see um, it's just a sketch of a prehistoric man. You can see the arrows in the animals, these black arrows right here, if you can see it. Yes, yeah, so these were found in caves. As you can see, that's the Caballos cave in, found in Spain. So these sketches are right there on the caves. Now, it was also a form of ritual worship. So when they drew these animals and other paintings and stuff on the walls of the caves, it was serving as a ritual or worship. It is believed that some of these caves were not even inhabited by these prehistoric men. They were living outside, but they had the sketches in these caves, and they went there for some rituals when they wanted to hunt or for any religious purposes. So, the images of the animals found in the walls of the caves were believed to be objects of worship, so on which rituals and uh, were done for successful hunting activities. Again, special dances were believed to have been performed around the images for a good day's hunt. Now, during initiation ceremonies for the young ones in these caves and communities, uh, images of the animals were used for these rituals. Again, it was a teaching tool for amateur hunters. So the drawings and paintings and engravings in the caves were used as teaching aids for young hunters who had just joined the hunting team of the prehistoric man. So usually, the images of the animals fashioned as teaching aids 
to educate their, hunt, their new hunters about the character of the various species that they would meet during the hunt. So that was one of the reasons. Again, it is assumed that skilled cave hunters use these images to point out parts of each species of animals that could be targeted with spears. First timers were taught hunting skills using the images so that it will not be a strenuous task for them. Very, very interesting, isn't it? So, again, they were used to record information and narrating stories. Like we said earlier, the prehistoric man didn't have anything to write down. He, there was no written languages then, so he had to find a way of communicating to his members. And the arts and engravings and stuff that we find was another means. So they used this to record information for the future generation. Now, paintings and engravings of a group of head of animals were used to, in recording animal migrations throughout the passing seasons. Again, some animal compositions, like the composition of the rhinoceros, a wounded man, and a bison found in the Lascaux cave in uh, Dogony in France, were believed to narrate a tale of a hunt of, of what a heroic man's death. So you could have paintings in the caves narrating a story that one or a group of hunters of the prehistoric man had engaged in. So they draw this history or they make these drawings to just record the event that really happened. Again, most of the compositions in the several caves paintings were believed to have been the prehistoric man's means of recording events and situations experienced in his hunting activities, since there was no written form of recording of events. So as you see, or like we've discussed earlier, the cave paintings were very important because he had to use it to record information. Next, they were used as fertility charms. Yes, fertility charms. So look at the image in front of you. Um, this is a very important sculpture in the history of prehistoric art. And we'll get to know the ver name very soon. I think you should have a fair idea of what it is, especially for those who are in second year and third year of senior high school. So if you really know the name, let's find out whether you really do. So yes, this is the Venus of Willendorf, a very popular sculpture, prehistoric art piece. Now, this is a female sculpture figure discovered in some caves believed to be, and is believed to be the fertility goddess, responsible for childbirth and also the fertility of the soil. So that is the Willens, uh, Venus of Willendorf, a very nice sculpture piece but it has so many parts that we need to talk about and we'll describe it as and when we move on with the lesson. Now, emphasis is placed on the figure's reproductive features, reproductive features I mean, so look at the exaggerated parts like the breast, so there's a big breast, a thigh and a buttock and uh, there are tiny legs and arms, that's the description of the Venus of Willendorf. But scholars believe that these are Venuses and they are viewed as what sexual objects to the prehistoric man. Now these figures were believed to bring fertility to the cave women. They were also consulted through rituals to ensure that there's fertility of the land when the prehistoric men and women started agriculture or agricultural activities uh, just around the Neolithic period. Now reasons why the prehistoric man has a has the desire to be creative. This is a very important subject because the prehistoric man was, ve was a very creative person. F looking at what we've seen so far, he had the ability to do so many things that we couldn't even think of today. Now, the prehistoric men were very creative because they invented numerous things. They were original and they tried to experiment and explore their environment. Items created addressed his problems and satisfied his basic necessities of life. This is more so why we should learn about prehistoric art. Because if you are able to do things that are creative, then you are able to live in your environment. And as art students or other courses who are offering uh, GK as, the, uh, as one of their courses, it's very important that you learn this subject because you have to be very creative. Just, just like the prehistoric man, so that you can find solutions to new situations when they come. 
Now, the reason why the prehistoric man was des or desired to be very creative was that he created his own or some of the things that he did to show that he was creative was that he did his own what made his or created his own lambs for from clay or stone and he fueled it with fat and marrow obtained from animals and this helped him to generate heat and to obtain light that's a lot of creativity for you to be able to think of something like this uh, make your own lambs get the fuel knowing that even fat can serve as fuel for lambs was something else that's just top-notch creativity again the caveman out of his instincts produced artificial light by striking two stones together to illuminate the dark caves or cavings and the inner parts of the rocky structures so if you have watched in some movies you realize people just make light or fire by striking two stones and then before you realize it's light or providing some fire and light very very creative isn't it again he was able to manufacture his own colors by grinding earth colors into powder and mixing it with binders obtained from animal fat he also used egg yolk to mix or sometimes egg white saliva and even blood and sometimes cave water he obtained black color from botanic charcoal and then burnt bones what is more creative than this to find natural ways of getting colors from the environment again the prehistoric man applied the colors to the limestone surfaces used using parts of moss or fur and brushes made of fur feather or chewed sticks so that was how he was making his brushes for his paintings on the caves or the walls of the caves next the caveman sprayed colors at fat or uh, at far reaching ends or areas by blowing them through the tubes of animal bones or reeds against a hand held up with fingers spread over or open to the rock surfaces to make hand silhouettes um just to explain that so there were portions of the caves that he couldn't easily reach out with his brush so he found an innovative way of ensuring that these colors got to these uh, uh, cravings or pieces of holes that he found just to make his art so like you said he had a bone marrow sometimes uh, the bones with a space in between there he put his color and just blow it through there so that you could just spray it around the area so that he could have his painting what is more creative than this again the caveman out of his imagination used flint tools in making his engravings and used flat large bones shells or stones as palettes for the mixing of colors there's nothing more to say he was just too creative he made his own palettes by using shells and other things that he found he was even able to use flint stones as a sharp tool to engrave the walls of the caves to make his drawings was more creative than this now again he built scaffolds from wood and st stabilized it against the wall by driving poles into the limestone surface of the cave to enable him paint high places above the ground level so again earlier we said he was trying to paint within holes and he had challenges doing that he solved it by using the marrow there was another instance where he had to paint very high in the cave the, most of the caves that they found were very high so he did some scaffoldings of some sort and then tried to climb up and then do his painting on these walls he will go any length to ensure that these paintings were made on these caves and that is a form of creativity i believe scaffolding for these modern builders and whatever these ideas were gotten from the prehistoric man a very creative person he used sharp flint stones for engravings and pecking out animal forms on rock surfaces as we discussed earlier now the caveman was able to pick ideas from the drawings of the images of animals from the contours and bumpy surfaces of the cave as well as the rock formations that's another intrinsic that something that beats the mind so sometimes he looks at the surface of the wall and then he thinks of way of drawing such that the contours of the walls of the caves will just pick up with the drawing what's more creative than this again the caveman used the pointillist effect of creating images of the animals 
He achieved this by covering the fingers with orchids before pressing it against the limestone surface to create series of dots. So, pointillism, modern pointillism. The prehistoric man was the first person to even think of this technique of art. So on the caves, on some of the caves, you could see signs of the, uh, this pointillism uh, technique of art in their caves. Now, what are the types of art made by the caveman? We've identified a lot. I know you could remember some. Um, I think we remembered, uh, we, we remember we mentioned a few, like paintings and sculpture and whatever. But let's look at all of them in a go. So the prehistoric man made artworks such as drawings or paintings, engravings. He did some modeling with clay and other things. Um, carving, he did carving. He carved bones and as well wood. Then he did some leather work, some pottery, and then some textiles. Let's take each one of them. So with drawings, he made he made these drawings on the surfaces of the caves and on rocky plates by using charcoal and flint stones. So he had these um, surfaces of rocks and he could just use charcoal that were made from sometimes bones themselves. He made charcoal, black uh, color from this charcoal, or sometimes he made it from the bone and they used it to paint. Okay, or sometimes he used a flint stone, that's a sharp stone to do the drawings on these walls. Now paintings were made by the use of color or pigment obtained from orchids, from minerals, charcoal from wood and bone, and blood, as well as white cowling. So he obtained all these from his environment, very natural. That tells you how creative he, he was, as we were discussing earlier. So he got all these things from his environment to use in his artworks and paintings. The caveman produced various images by engraving Thus, and pecking outlines or, uh, of the drawn animals with sharp flint stones. Now, the caveman used the images of animals as well as numerous figurines of the Venuses of fertility by the use of the mod uh, modeling technique with white cowling and then clay. So, he molded these Venuses with this clay that he found into three dimensional forms. Again, he did some carving, which is basically a subtractive sculptural method. And, and it was employed by this caveman in producing the works of art. And he did these carvings mostly using wood, ivory, bone, rocky mass, and stones, and so on. He used so many things that to carve, as we have identified. That tells you how creative he was once more. Now, again, leather was obtained from the skins and hides of these animals. And they were tanned and used for leather work products like clothes, uh, used for tents, and also used as uh, temporal shelters, like we identified earlier. Now, in works of poetry, he crafted and decorated vases or vessels, which were used for storing oils and also other substances that he thought he could store these uh, in these uh, pots that he made. For textiles, he made so many items from palm branches, moss, grass, and so many other things. And then he also used it in, to produce his clothing and use it for other functional items. Now, what was the media used by the caveman? So the caveman used a variety of materials to produce his artworks. So this includes the following. The first was a brush. Do you remember what we said about the brush uh, earlier on? Yes, he used sticks, he chewed it, and then used it, sometimes the fur, and so on and so forth. Let's identify that once again, or let's discuss that once again. So brushes were made by beating or chewing the ends of the sticks, and then the feathers of large animals, of, uh, like uh, birds, and furs of animals were equally used as brushes for applying the manufactured paints. So after he had manufactured or made his paints, he used these tools in the form of brushes to paint his works in the caves. Then, like we said earlier, for the palette, he made large or he found large uh, bones and shells and stones and wood and then used them as palette, mixed these colors on it and then used it for his painting on the walls of the caves. Again, for drawing tools, he used pointed flint stones, which are used to create the outlines of objects. 
And these outlines were deepened and shaded using charcoal. Then colors he obtained from the earth, including yellow, red, brown, and orange. And the black, like we said, he obtained it from charcoal, burnt bones, or my manganese oxide, while white was ob obtained or gotten from the cowling, white cowling. Now, these were grounded with animal fat, and then, like we said, they mix it with the marrow, the egg yolk, the egg white, saliva, blood, and then use it to obtain their paint. Then for engraving and modeling, he, point, he used pointed stones and flints uh, for his engraving. And then also he used the hands as a, as a tool for modeling his works. Now, what are the techniques used by the caveman? So obviously we mentioned a technique earlier. Do you remember that technique? Yes, we mentioned pointillism. But he had other techniques that he, we believe, was invented by the prehistoric man. So what are some of these techniques? which are even very relevant today. So some of these techniques, the first that we identify is superimposition. Superimposition. So what is superimposition? Let's look at the diagram there first, then we go to the various texts that we find on this page. So look at the, there's a cow at the background. As you can see, I'm trying to make an outline. So on it, there is a horse this one so you could see that the horse has been drawn over the cow that you see at the background so what is superimposition so it's a technique that involves the making of a new painting or engraving on an old one so after a successful hand by the prehistoric man a new painting is done over the discarded one just like we see in the drawing so the horse has been drawn over the oxen or the cow that we see at the background because we believe the cow at the background is no more relevant they had already gone for the hunt and now there was a time or the new time to go and go for another hunting so they draw the horse over and that's what we imply by super imposition another technique was super position so let's look at super position now look at the drawing right here on the right hand side first he went to hunt for i believe that's a deer so i'm trying to put these red outlines on it so you can see by the horn that it was a deer or something of, of that sort then he comes after the hunt and then this time he's super using the super position method where he used the parts of the old drawing that he did and then extend it. So as you can see, this time it's looking like a horse and no more a deer. So when we talk about superposition, we are saying this involves the placing of a new painting or engraving on an old one. So more or less, it's like an extension. So the old drawing will be there, but parts of it will still be used for the new drawing. And that's what we mean by superposition. This technique was invented by the prehistoric man. How more creative could he have been? The next or the last of these techniques that we can identify is just a position. So let's look at the drawing once more before we go to the text. Now I can see a deer here, another one, then another, then another, then another. You can see a form of movement. And these drawings are not placed over one over the other, like we saw in the super position. It is not also placed over another to erode the old one, just like we found in the super in, uh, in position. But this time they are lying side by side. So there's one, then another, then another, then another, then another placed side by side. So this technique of super position, which is um, done earlier was also done in another way so this time we have just a position where the animals were placed side by side so in this technique the new paintings are done at one side of the old paintings so we don't draw over it but this time you just put it by the side that's the third technique that the prehistoric man was using now again he used the rendering of 
animals in a realistic form. He rendered his animals in a realistic form, which is which is beats it just beats the mind how he was able to do artwork realistically. So paintings, engravings, and carvings represented were represented in realism or in semi abstraction. That's a little bit abstract. Now the flat tone painting technique was used, and some of these images of the animals were deliberately distorted to serve as magical or religious purposes. So look at this painting. Um, you can see these works are, are marvelous and they are realistically drawn. And you can see the, the nature of the painting, which is flat color. So there are no uh, shadows or tones in the work. Just the flat nature of uh, uh, these animals, just in one color. So, what are the sources of ideas for the prehistoric man? Where did he find all of his ideas? And the caveman gathered, or generated a lot of ideas from the drawings of the images of the animals, from the contours or cracks on the walls of the caves, and then also the shape of the rocky mass. So, he looked at the walls like we mentioned earlier, then he formed his ideas from how to draw these images, which was something else. He's, he's, more creative than I can think. So look at the um, image that we see there. So look at the caves, the contours of the caves, and he was able to know exactly where to place his animals on these walls of the caves. So he was just using the contours of these caves to make his drawings. That's another technique. So we identified five techniques that he used. So these are some of the things that the prehistoric man was doing. Now, there are a lot of readings that you have to do for me. Uh, you have to read about the Stone Age. There are three stages of the Stone Age, which has to do with the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and then the Neolithic. The Paleolithic, which is the Old Stone Age, lasted between 30,000 to 15,000 BC. Then the Mesolithic period lasted between 15,000 to 10,000 BC. And then lastly, the Neolithic period lasted between 10,000 around 5,000 to 4,000 BC. This is a further reading that you have to do because if you do these readings, it's going to further explain most of the things that I've tried to summarize in this lesson. So take time and read about these uh, uh, various stages of the Stone Age. It's going to help you to understand further the daily activities of the prehistoric man. Now I also want you to solve these questions for me very important that you solve them so at least it will help you remember most of the things that we've learned so first i want you to brief to be able to uh, briefly explain the beginnings relevance and locations of these prehistoric art remember we found some of these locations all over the world uh, in particular we found some in africa and parts of europe and even all over the world try and identify these locations and give them their names and the periods in which they were found Again, identify the nature uses and reasons for creating prehistoric art. Why did the prehistoric man do his art at all? We've identified these things. So go through the slides once more. I'll go through the lesson once more and try and find out why the prehistoric man did what he did. Then lastly, state the types of art, media, and techniques used by the prehistoric man or the prehistoric artist. So try and find these tools. We mentioned a lot of them. Even go for the tools, materials, and media, find them. So the stones, the flint stones, the charcoal, the bones, as, and the shells that he did. Find out these things and jot them down and then have them well written down. At least if you are able to go through these uh, topics uh, or these questions, you should be able to, to be able to understand and then answer very, uh, very good questions as and when they come in your wasi. So it's been so good having you once more. This has been Kojo Uswapia, and I've been treating general knowledge in art. It's been so wonderful, and I know we're going to meet next time for another very interesting lesson. Have a nice and blessed day to all of you. Ciao. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.